Hey guys, welcome. I'm so glad you signed up for this course. Programming has many different languages, such as Python, Java, and C++, that all follow the same big ideas. The language that you're going to be learning in this course is Python. There are a lot of different things you can do with Python, and it is one of the easiest languages to learn. So let's get started and install Python. So first, we're going to go to the link www.python dot org slash downloads slash to get to this link you could also just google download python and click on the first link that pops up then click on this button right here that says download python it should be the first button you see when the download is finished open up the installer and click through all the steps they guide you through you can accept any terms and conditions, and then click Install. The installation may take a while, and that's okay. Once you're done installing Python, you can install Visual Studio Code, which is the code editor that we're going to use. We're going to write, debug, and run our code on this platform. Please refer to the next article for how to install Visual Studio Code. Welcome to your first unit of programming. We're going to learn how to use the print function. Don't worry, this is one of the easiest things you can learn in programming. So the way programming works is that you write a bunch of code and then you run that code and the output of that code, if there is any, will be displayed onto the terminal. When you want to print any text or message, or in other words, you want any text outputted onto the terminal, this is the format that you will always follow. Print open brackets, open quotation marks, and in the quotation marks, you'll insert the message you want displayed onto the terminal. For example, let's say I want to write a program that prints the text, you're doing great in this course. Then I would follow the same format and write print, open brackets, open quotation marks, and I would write, you're doing great in this course, exclamation mark. Now you know how to print text and messages. So, anytime you want to print something, just follow this format and put your text inside the quotation marks. Now that you know how it works, we're going to try a little activity with the print function in the next video. Guys, so now that you know about the print function, let's try to actually print something using code. In this activity, you're going to print the text, Hello World. You're going to write the code in Visual Studio, which you downloaded earlier, remember? So go ahead and open up Visual Studio. When you write programs in Visual Studio, you're going to be writing it in files. Every time you want to write a new program, you're going to open a new file and write it there. So, to open a file, you can double-click this text that says New File. Or you can just use the command command n. So go ahead and open a new file. Select the option as Python for the type of file. Now you'll want to give the file a name. So save this file by clicking on command s and then name the file hello world.py. You will always save all files with the ending .py whenever you are writing code in Python. So remember to always save your files in this course with the extension .py because that indicates that you're using Python. Now, we're going to print out the text, hello world. You're going to follow the format for the print function that you learned in the previous video. So, you're going to write print open brackets, open quotation marks, and inside the quotation marks, you can write the text that you want to print, which is hello world. Once you're done writing the code, go to this little icon here and click on run and debug. This will run your code. So once you click on run and debug, and you select Python, look at the terminal below and you should see the text hello world printed to the terminal. You wrote the code that printed that. Feel free to play around with the print function and print out other messages. 
Now you know how to print any text you want using Python. Stay tuned to learn more in the next video. Hey guys, so this is a super quick video where I just wanted to tell you guys about comments. Comments are basically notes that you can make while writing a program. When you want to write a comment, just start the comment with a hashtag and then write any note you want to write. For example, I can write hashtag this is a program about printing things. Just keep in mind that your note can only stay on one line. So I can't write hashtag this is and then go to the next line and write a program. However, I can use a new hashtag on the next line and write hashtag this is and go to the next line and write hashtag a program. Comments are not a part of your code and will not affect your code in any way. They are also not necessary. They are just for you to keep track of your thoughts and make notes if you want to. That's all for comments. Hey guys, welcome to your second unit where you're going to learn about variables. So what are variables? Variables are like containers for storing data. The names of variables must start with either a letter or an underscore. They can be any combination of letters, numbers, and underscores. Here are some examples of variable names. x, y, z, my underscore variable, and this underscore is underscore a underscore variable. You should know that variable names are case sensitive. For example, that means that the variable name my underscore variable is a completely different variable then the name my underscore variable where the M is capital. So you can store data such as numbers and texts in each of these variables. Now, how do we declare variables? If I wanted to create a variable X and store the value five in there, I would simply write X equals to five. Yes, it's that simple. To declare a variable, you just write the variable name, write an equal to sign, and write the data you want to store. Here is another example. If I wanted to store data, such as a text, apple, then I would create a variable, such as fruit underscore name, and store that text in there. So I would say fruit underscore name equals to apple, and I would put apple in quotation marks. Now, calling on this variable would return apple. So remember the print function that we learned? In this case, if I were to write the code print fruit underscore name, can you guess what the output would be? Let's run it and see. Yep, it will be apple. So when you print out variables, the data stored in the variable is printed. It works for numbers too. Let's say I declared the variable y equals to 5, and then I wrote print y. Guess what the output would be? I'm going to run it, and you can see on the terminal that it will be 5. You can try it out too. Open up Visual Studio and create a new file by clicking on Command N or by clicking on New File. Then, save the file and name it variable.py. You can play around with variables in this file. So go ahead and create variables and try to print them out. You can start with a simple one. Write message equals to hello in quotation marks in the first line. And then in the next line, write print message. Now run the code and you should get the output hello in the terminal. See how that works? Feel free to play around with variables a little bit more. You'll learn more about variables in the next video. Hey guys, welcome back. We're going to learn more about assigning values to variables in this video. So when you assign data to a variable, that data is not fixed. You can reassign different data if you want. Here's what I mean. Let's say I declare the variable x is equal to 5. Then, on the next line, I reassign a different value to x and I write x is equal to 9. The value of x would now be 9. 
I reassign the data 9 to x. And if I were to write print x in the next line, can you guess what the output would be? When I run the code, you can see that the output is 9. So you can reassign values to variables. You can also reassign the values of variables to other variables. Here's what I mean. Let's say I write the following code. I write a is equal to 5, b is equal to 6, and then I reassign the value of a to the value of b by writing a is equal to b. Now, the value of a will be 6 and not 5. It's now the value of b. If I were to write print a, the output will be 6 and not 5 because I reassigned the value of a to b. This works the same way for text and other data as well. Try it out yourself. Go back to the same file variable.py and delete all the existing code in there. Now, refer to the next article to guide you through a small, simple activity you will do in this file to understand this concept better. In this video, I just wanted to show you guys some different ways you can assign values to multiple variables. Let's say I had three variables, x, y, and z, and I wanted to assign the value 5 to each of these variables. I could write it like this, x is equal to 5, y is equal to 5, and z is equal to 5. But there is an easier way of doing that. I could simply just write x is equal to y is equal to z is equal to 5. These two pieces of code mean the same thing, and they're both right except that the second one is easier and faster. Here's another such idea. Let's say I wanted to create three variables called food1, food2, and food3, and I wanted to assign the values cookie, pie, and pancake to each of those variables respectively. I could write the code like this. Food1 is equal to cookie, food2 is equal to pie, food3 is equal to pancake. However, I could also write the code this way. Food1, comma, food2, comma, food3 is equal to cookie, comma, pie, comma, pancake. Again, these two pieces of code mean the same thing. So, these are two ideas that show you easier ways of assigning multiple variables to multiple values. Feel free to play around with these two concepts and write your own code to try it out. Hey guys, in this video, we're going to learn about strings. So remember print hello world? Hello world is what you call a string. A string is a sequence of characters. Characters meaning alphabets, numbers, spaces, and symbols. Any characters you put inside quotation marks is a string. Here are some examples of strings. This course is so fun. Nine nine dollar hash percentage. Basically, anything you put inside quotation marks is a string. You should use strings whenever you want to print or store a series of characters. You can store strings in variables. From the previous variable unit, do you remember some of the examples I showed you, such as fruit underscore name is equal to apple and food one is equal to cookie? In these cases, apple and cookie are both strings because they are both inside quotation marks. You must always put strings in quotation marks. The following declaration of a string, food1 is equal to cookie, would result in an error because there are no quotation marks. Here's an example. If I wanted to print a string such as hello world I'm learning python, then I could create a variable and store a string in it and then print it out. So, I would create a variable such as my underscore string and I would store the string hello world I'm learning python in that variable. See that hello world I'm learning python is inside quotation marks. This is what makes it a string. Then I would write print my underscore string to print out the variable. And 
when I run the code, I get hello world, I'm learning Python as my output. I could also just print out a string by writing print hello world, I'm learning Python. That's how you print strings. Now let's say that in my underscore string, I wanted the output to be hello world on the first line and I'm learning Python on the second line, like this. I don't want it to be consecutive words. What would I do then? I could use the backslash n feature. So the backslash n is basically like this. Whenever you write backslash n in a string, it means that you are going to the next line. Backslash n is never actually printed out and doesn't count as a character. So if I wanted the string to be hello world on the first line and then go to the next line and be I'm learning Python on the second line, I would write it like this. My string is equal to and inside quotation marks, hello world, comma, backslash n, I'm learning Python. Predict what the output would be when I print this string now. When I run it, you can see that it prints out hello world on the first line and then prints out I'm learning Python on the next line. Try the next activity to practice using backslash n in strings. Hey guys, welcome back. I'm going to show you how the computer counts characters in a string. So as you can see here, I have the string hello. Each letter in this string is a character. If I asked you how many characters were in the string, then you would most likely count the number of characters in the string. In this string, there are one, two, three, four, five characters, and that's true. If I asked you what character number one was, you would probably say H. But here's the thing. The computer counts the characters starting from zero, not from one. So in this case, H is the zeroth character, E is the first character, L is the second character, and so on. That is the main takeaway of this video. When you count characters in a string, always start the first one as zero because that's how Python counts it. Now, refer to the next article to practice the content that you learned. Hey guys, in this video, we're going to learn how to access specific characters of a string. As you can see over here, I have the string programming exclamation mark exclamation mark stored in a variable called my underscore string. So what if I wanted to print out only the fifth character in the string. Remember that the computer would read the fifth character as character number four because the first character is actually zero. So if I wanted to print out only the fifth character, here's what I would write. Print my underscore string and in square brackets, I would write four. Whenever you want to access a certain character of a string, Always follow the format, variable name, and in square brackets, write the number. Guess what the output of this code would be? When I run the code, you can see that the output is only R, which is the fifth character. Now what if I wanted to print only the first five characters of the string? I want to print the character numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, but not number 5, because those are the first five characters. Here's what I would do. I would write print my underscore string, and in square brackets, I would write 0 is to 5. This technique of printing a certain chunk of a string is called slicing. When you want to print only a certain chunk of a string, Follow the format, variable name, and in square brackets, write the first number, a colon, and then write the second number plus one. Remember this, the second number in the square brackets should always be the last character you want to print out plus one because of what we learned about the computer starting counting characters from zero. 
So in this case, if I want to print out the characters 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, then I would write 0 is to 4 plus 1 in the square brackets, which is 0 is to 5. So when I run the code, you can see that it prints P-R-O-G-R, -R, the first five characters of the string. Here's another example. If I wanted to print out only the last two exclamation marks of the string, what would I do then? Pause the video and take a guess. Well, when you count the characters in the string starting from zero, you'll find that the last two exclamation marks are characters number 11 and 12. So I would write print my underscore string and in the square brackets, I would write 11 is to 13. This code will print everything in the string from character number 11 to character number 13 minus 1, which is 12. So when I run the code, you can see that the output is the last two exclamation marks. Now try the activity below to practice slicing strings yourself. Hey guys, you're going to learn about concatenating strings. This one is a very simple concept. Concatenating strings is basically adding two or more strings together to make one big string. Just use a plus sign between the strings you want to add together. Here's an example. If I wanted to print hello world to the terminal, I could use hello as one string and world as a separate string and then add those strings together, like this. I would write print open brackets and put hello inside quotation marks. Hello is my first string. Then I will put a plus sign and then put space world inside quotation marks, which is my second string. Notice that I put a space before world because I want there to be a space. Without a space, this is what the output would look like. So, when I run the code, you can see that it prints out hello world and adds the two strings together. That's how you add strings. Hey guys, in this video, you're going to learn about the find method in strings. The find method basically allows you to find any part of a string in a string. For example, if I had the string I'm learning Python stored in a variable called my underscore string, and I wanted to find where the word learning is in the string, then I would use the find method. The find method would basically give me the index, which means the character count, of the first occurrence of this word. So, if I wanted to print the index, which again means character count, of the string learning in my underscore string, then I would write print string.find and in brackets and in quotation marks, I would write learning. And when I run this code, it will return the character count of where learning occurs in my underscore string. This is the format you should follow for the find method. Write the name of the variable you want to find a string in, followed by a dot, followed by the word find, and then open brackets, and put the string you are looking for inside quotation marks inside the brackets. I'll show you another example. I'll create a variable called message and store the string hello world in it. Let's say I wanted to find the first occurrence of the letter L in the string and print out the index. Then I would write print and in brackets I would write message.find and then in another pair of brackets and in quotation marks I would write the letter L. Remember that I am finding only the very first occurrence of L, not all of them. Pause the video and guess what the output would be. The output is 2, because that is the index of when L first occurs in the string. Now what if I looked for an exclamation mark in the string? What number would it return then? 
Notice that there is no exclamation mark in message. When you look for something in a string that is not there, the number returned will always be negative one. For example, when I look for an exclamation mark in message and write print message.find exclamation mark, when I run this code, as you can see, the output is negative one. This is how the find method works. Feel free to play around with finding parts of strings in strings using the find method yourself. In the last unit, you learned about strings and how to store strings in variables. Strings are one kind of data type that you can use and store in variables. Numbers are another kind of data type that you can use and store in variables. You're going to learn about two kinds of number data types. The first one is integers or int. Integers are the numbers that don't have decimal points. You may remember some of the examples from the previous unit about variables, such as x is equal to 5 or y is equal to 10. In both these cases, I'm storing integers, which are 5 and 10, in variables. They are integers because they don't have decimal points. Numbers with decimal points are called floats. Some examples of the float data type are num1 is equal to 4.558, num2 is equal to negative 9.9, .9, and num3 is equal to 0.879. In these cases, num1, 2, and 3 are the variables, and the decimal values on the right are the data type. You know that if I print out one of these variables, it will return the number stored in the variable. For example, writing print num1 will return the value 4.558. Hey guys, welcome to your first video about operators. In Python, you can perform all types of operations. In this video, you're going to learn about arithmetic operators. Arithmetic operators are operators you use on numbers to perform simple operations, such as multiplication and addition. The basic arithmetic operators are the plus sign for addition, the minus sign for subtraction, an asterisk for multiplication, a forward slash for division, and a percentage sign for the modulus operator. The modulus operator returns the remainder of a division. For example, 7 mod 2 would be 1, because when you divide 7 by 2, the remainder is 1. You can carry out arithmetic operators on all numbers, including those stored in variables. Here are some examples. If I write print 6 times 4 and run the code, it returns the product of 6 and 4, which is 24. This works the same way for all other operators. Another example is, let's say I create three variables with numbers stored in them. Num1 is equal to 4, num2 is equal to 88, and num3 is equal to 9. If I want to get the sum of these three numbers, I can write print num1 plus num2 plus num3. And when I run the code, it returns 101 which is the sum of all the numbers stored in those respective variables. Go ahead and use arithmetic operators on numbers yourself and play around with them to get a better understanding of the concept. Hey guys, you're going to learn about comparison operators and booleans in this video. So comparison operators are literally operators that compare two numbers. These are the comparison operators with their respective symbols. There is less than, greater than, less than or equal to, more than or equal to, equal to, and lastly, not equal to. 
We will get back to these operators in a few seconds. Now what are booleans? A boolean is basically either a true or a false. The way it works is you write a statement and the output is whether that statement is true or false. This is where comparison operators come in. When I write a statement comparing two numbers such as 4 is greater than 5, the output will be whether that comparison is true or false. In this case, the output would be false because 4 is not greater than 5. Let's look at some examples of this. If I were to write print 9 is equal to 8, the output would be whether or not 9 is equal to 8. Guess what the output would be? It would obviously be false. However, if I were to write print 9 is not equal to 8, the output would be true because 9 is not equal to 8. I can do the same with numbers stored in variables. I will create a variable x is equal to 10 and another variable y is equal to 96. If I were to write print x is less than or equal to y, then the output would be true because 10 is less than 96. That is what comparison operators do. Logical operators are the last kind of operator you need to learn about. You learned how when you use comparison operators on two numbers, the output returns whether that statement is true or false. Well, logical operators return values in reference to whether two or more statements are true or false. There are three logical operators, and, or, and not. I will show you examples using all of them. The first logical operator, and, returns true if both the statements are true, and it returns false if even one statement is false. Or, returns true if one or more of the statements is true. It only returns false if all of the statements are false. And lastly, for the operator not, if the statement is false, then it returns true. And if the statement is true, then it returns false. Now for the examples. Let's say I have three variables. A is equal to 9, B is equal to 3, and C is equal to 2. If I were to write print A is more than B and A is more than C, then here is what the computer would do. It would check if the first statement, A is greater than B, is true, which it is because 9 is more than 3. Then it would check if the second statement, A is more than C, is true, which it also is. So. If both the statements are true, can you guess what the output would be? It would be true. However, if I change one of the statements to false, the output will be false. So, if I change the second statement, a is less than c, then it would evaluate to false. What if I wanted to use the same statements, but I wanted the output to be true even if one of them was false. I want the output to be true as long as one statement is true. Then, I would use the OR operator instead of the AND operator. Now, when I run the code, guess what the output would be? The output would be true, because one of these statements is true. Lastly, if I were to write print not 9 is not equal to 0, can you guess what the output would be? 
This is tricky because there are two knots, the logical knot operator and the not equal to comparison operator. The output will be false because 9 is not equal to 0 is a true statement and the not operator prints the opposite of that. It's important to note that you cannot use and, or, or not as names for variables because that might cause errors. I encourage you to play around with these operators on Visual Studio to gain a better understanding of them. Until now, you've only learned how to code while giving the input yourself. For example, you only know how to assign values to variables yourself. We haven't asked the user for anything. In this video, you learn how to take input from a user. The function that is used to do this is called the input function. It is another built-in function that Python has. It's very useful as it is the only function that lets you take input from the user. This makes it interactive. We're going to be using it a lot from here on out. The syntax for the input function is just input, open brackets, open quotation marks, and in the quotation marks, write the string you want to display. It's important to remember that you will always need to store the input that you take from the user in a variable. Here's an example of how to use the input function. Let's say I wanted to ask the user for their name and store it in a variable called name. So I would create a variable called name and I would say name is equal to input, open brackets, open quotation marks, enter your name. Now when I run this code, the string enter your name is printed to the console. Now, the user can actually type in their name. I'm going to type in my name, Talika, and click on enter. Now, the input that I got asked for, which is the string Talika, my name, will be stored in the variable name. Always remember to store the input in a variable, otherwise you won't be able to retrieve it. Now, to use the input, I could display the message, hi name. The name will be whatever name the user enters. I could write print hi plus name plus exclamation mark. If I try to run the code now, it asks me for my name. I enter my name and then it displays the message, Hi Talika, because Talika is what I entered as my name. Now I want you to write the same code and try this out by entering your name. Being able to take in user input and make the program interactive is one of the coolest parts of coding. Hi guys. So you learned how to take input from a user. But the thing is, that when you take input, it is always in the form of a string. So what if you wanted to take input in the form of numbers? You would have to convert the string input to numbers. Remember the two types of numbers we learned, integers and floats? If you wanted to take input as a number, then you would need to convert the string to an integer or a float. It is very simple to convert a string to an integer or float. You just have to write int, open brackets, open quotation marks, and enter the string you want converted to an integer. Or you can write float, open brackets, open quotation marks, and enter the string you want converted to a float. Let's say I have the string 555 stored in the variable a. If I wanted to convert this to an integer, I would write a is equal to int, open brackets, open quotation marks, and I would write 555. Now, 
the value stored in variable a would be the integer 555. Let's say I have the variable b with the string 99.86 stored in it. Since this is a decimal, if I wanted it to remain a decimal, I would have to convert it to a float number. Can you guess how I would convert this to a float number? Again, I would just put float and put brackets around the string like this. We are going to be casting strings to numbers a lot in one of the projects at the end of this course. So, if I wanted to take input from a user and convert that input to an integer or float, here is what I would do. I would create the variable that I wanted to store that number in, which can be called num. Then I would write int, open brackets, input, open brackets, and in quotation marks, I would write enter an integer because that's the text I want displayed. Now, if I run the code and enter the input as the number 7, this will be cast to an integer type and be stored as an integer. Hey guys, so in this video, you're going to learn about a very important and useful coding concept. The if-else statement. So what is the if-else statement? It's a statement that lets us run a certain function or command only if a certain statement is true. Do you remember comparison operators and booleans from the previous videos? We're going to use those here. Here's an example of the if statement. Let's say I have two variables. A is equal to 16 and B is equal to 13. My goal for the program now is that if A is greater than B, then Python will print the message A is greater. So I would write if a is greater than b colon print a is greater. This code basically says that if a statement is true, then print out the statement. In this case, the statement a is greater than b is true. So when I run this code, the statement a is greater is printed out. As you can see, we've used a boolean and a comparison operator in the statement a is greater than b. Now let's say if a and b are equal, I want to print the message they are equal. And if they aren't equal, then I want to print this message not equal. So I would write if a is equal to equal to b, print they are equal, else print not equal. This is a good example of the if-else statement. In this case, the statement a is equal to equal to b is not true. So guess what the output would be? It would be not equal. In this example, we actually said if a certain statement is true, print they are equal, and if it's false, print not equal. This is actually a boolean because it only runs on the command if the statement is true. If the statement is false, it runs a different command. And booleans are basically true or false. The if-else statement really depends on the boolean. The example also shows the use of a comparison operator equal to equal to. We can use all the different comparison operators for the if-else statement. For example, we could also say that if a is greater than b, print a is greater or equal to b. Else, print a is less than b. In this case, greater than or equal to is the comparison operator. This would work the same way for all other comparison operators. 
Don't comparison operators and booleans make a lot more sense now? Hey guys, so in this video, you're going to learn the actual syntax for the if-else statement. By now, you may have gotten a gist of the if-else statement format. The syntax or format looks something like this. If test expression, body if if, else, the body if else. In the body of if, you would put a print function or something you want the computer to carry out only if the statement is true. And in the body of else, you'd put what you want the computer to carry out if the statement is false. There are some technicalities to be careful of in the syntax. First, always remember to put a colon after the if condition and after the else. You will get an error if you don't. Second, it's super important to remember to have proper indentation in the if-else statement. If you don't indent properly, you will again get an error. An indent is a big space or tab before the statement to be carried out. Usually, your computer should take care of the indentation for you if you put a colon. But always make sure that there is an indentation before the body of if and the body of else, like this. In the syntax, you can see that there is a colon after the if and else conditions and an indentation before the bodies of if and else. Now that you know how to use the if else statement, Try the activity on the next article. So we were learning about the if-else statement and how to tell the computer if something is true, do this, else, do that. But what if I have more than one condition to be met? What if I want to write a code that does this? If the condition A is greater than B is true, it prints greater. If the condition A is equal to B is true, it prints equal, otherwise it prints less. We can use the ELIF statement to do this. ELIF is just short for else if. The ELIF statement comes under the if and it can be used in the same command to add more conditions. So in this case, I could write the following code. If A is greater than B, print greater. Elif, A is equal to equal to B, print equal. Else, print less. You can add as many elifs and conditions as you want inside the code. Here, I just used one elif. As you can see, the elif has to come after the if and before the else. That means that your statement always needs to begin with an if and end with an else statement. This is the syntax for the elif statement. If test expression, write the statement, elif test expression, write the statement, and so on. Notice that you must use colons and indentations with the ELIF statement as well. Now there is a challenge activity for you to try out with the ELIF statement in the next article. It's only a bit of a challenge because I won't guide you through the whole thing, but you can do it. Now we're going to learn about the last topic of this course, loops. In this course, we're going to learn about the for loop. Loops are exactly what they sound like. You state a specific condition for which you want Python to keep looping through until it has been met. You can loop through a string, a range of numbers, and even a list using a for loop. We haven't learned about lists, so we're not going to worry about that. But we are going to learn about how to loop through strings and a range of numbers. So. This is the syntax for the for loop. For value in sequence body of the loop. In the syntax, the sequence can be a string, a list, or a range. 
The sequence is the thing that you want to loop through. The value is just the current number, character, or thing that is being looped through. The value is a variable of your choice. In the body, you write the command that you want to be carried out for the value. You could say print value, which would print every number in the range or every character in the string. You could even write other things in the body of the loop. Remember that even in loops, you need to put a colon after the first line of code and put an indentation before the body of the loop. If you forget to use a colon right after the sequence or an indentation right before the body of the loop, it will cause an error. An example is that I could say 4x in fruit colon print x. Here, Fruit is a variable with a string stored in it, and x is the current character of the string fruit. In this example, Python is looping through each character in the string and printing each one out. One of the best ways to understand for loops is to see examples and do them yourselves. So, in the next few videos, I'm going to show you examples of looping through strings and a range of numbers. You're welcome to try these examples with the videos. Believe me, for loops will make more sense once you're done with the examples. Hey guys, in this activity, we're going to write a program to loop through the string hello, and we're going to print out each character of the string. So, we're going to create a new file in Visual Studio Code, and then save that file and name it loops.py. Then, we're going to create a variable to store the string hello in. So, create a variable called my underscore string and assign it the value hello. Now, to loop through my underscore string, we're going to use the for loop syntax from the previous video. In this case, our sequence is what we want to loop through, which is the variable my underscore string. The value can be any variable to store each character in. Let's say that the variable name of the values is C. And the body of the loop will be print C because we want to print each character of the string that we loop through. So we're going to write for C in my underscore string colon print c. So in this code, c is going to be each character of the string hello, and as we loop through each character of the string, Python will print it out. So when we run this code, you can see that the output is each character of the string hello printed out on a separate line. This is how you can loop through each character of a string. Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to show you how to loop through a range of numbers. Looping through a range of numbers is basically specifying a range of numbers you want to loop through, such as 2 and 11, or 5 and 23. Python loops through each number between 2 and 11, or 5 and 23. When you want to loop through a range of numbers, you follow the same for loop syntax, except that the sequence would be range, first number, comma, second number. So the syntax would look like this. For i in range, open brackets, first number, comma, second number, close brackets, colon, and then put the body of the loop in the next line. Here, i is just a variable that represents each number you are looping through. And the first and second numbers basically define the starting and ending numbers that you want to loop through. Python will loop through all the numbers from the first to the second number, but the second number is not included. So if my numbers were 2 and 11, Python would loop through 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on until 10 but it would not include 11. So let's do an activity looping through a range of numbers. 
So far, we've only printed out the values that we have looped through. We've never done anything else in the body of the loop. In this activity, we will loop through all the numbers from 1 to 10, and then, in the body of the loop, we will add all these numbers together and store the sum in a variable. Then, we will print out that sum at the end. So first, we will create the variable that we want to store the sum of all these numbers in. Let's call that variable sum and assign it the value 0 for now. At the end of the loop, we want the value of sum to be like this. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 and so on until 10. Now let's loop through all the numbers from 1 to 10. Remember that when we write range first number comma second number, the second number is not included in the loop. So, in order to loop from the numbers 1 to 10, 10 included, we will write range and in the brackets 1 comma 11. Now, 11 won't be included, but 10 will. So the code to loop through the numbers would be 4i in range in brackets 1 comma 11 colon. Now in the body of the loop, we will need to add each number that we loop through to the sum. So in the body of the loop, we'll write sum is equal to sum plus i. Take some time to think about it if you want. Do you see what we did there? We added the current number to the sum and assigned the value as new, the new sum. Now we want to print out the sum. Make sure to exit the for loop before you print out the sum, because you only want to print out the sum at the end, when it is done looping through all the numbers. So we will print out the sum by writing print sum. Make sure that there is no indentation behind print sum, because that would mean that you are still inside the for loop. Now, when we run this code, you can see that the output is 55, which is the sum of all the numbers from 1 to 10. That's how you can use for loops to loop through a range of numbers. That's it for for loops.